Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the Monday SITP Colloquium. Today we are very happy to have Renato Renner from ETH Zurich, and he will tell us about uh, the consistency of quantum theory when considering users of quantum theory. Okay, Renato, you can- Okay, can thanks a lot the Sarah, for the introduction. Let me just now start my screen sharing. I hope it works again. Okay. Okay, so you see the title of my talk is about sort experiments. And sort experiments are in a way the theorists tool to explore the world. And I will say a few things about them in general at the beginning. And also about the first or the second part, I should say, of the title, namely about the range of validity of quantum theory. This question, of course, came up very early um, in, within the development of quantum mechanics. And as you may know, um, it was already in, described by Schrödinger, very pictorial with this picture of a, of a cat. So he was asking essentially whether the formalism and the predictions of quantum mechanics would also apply to macroscopic objects like a cat. By the way, this is actually um, a picture. Okay, you, I should maybe make this a bit smaller. Then you see the subtitle. This is actually really the cat that stands in front of Schrödinger's house. And incidentally, his house is almost next to where I lived. So I took this picture. And you can also find almost the same picture on the Wikipedia page about Schrödinger's cat, where you also can read some more information about what that is. Anyway, there um, are other objects which I could also probably in principle at least see from my house, but here my camera has not a good enough resolution. Nevertheless, such pictures have been taken. These are, um, of course, much larger objects, but again, the question arises whether the formalism of quantum mechanics is able to correctly describe these objects, for example, black holes, or and of course, black holes could be small, but let's say black holes that are big enough to make interesting experiments with them, throwing, for example, an observer into it, and um, so that he still has time to do something in between crossing the horizon and um, hitting the singularity. So all this um, could be summarized by this slide. So what we are really asking is, whether the formalism or the theory that we developed, which extremely successfully describes object on a, on a very small scale and also quite well um, objects here on a medium scale. I mean, maybe also very well, but the experiments stop to be very accurate as we go to larger objects. Question is now, does the same theory also describe macroscopic objects or even very big objects? Now, it's quite hopeless, at least with today's technology, to explore this question purely experimentally. Of course, we, there are many very good experimentalists who try to push the frontiers and go more here to the right and somehow um, try to test or do interference experiments, for example, with relatively large molecules and so on. But the series can, of course, easily just go here in salt. And so that's kind of the value of thought experiments. But if we are trying to make thought experiments and, and try to explore what happens here, we somehow first need to have an idea of what it could be that could potentially make quantum theory invalid in this regime, whereas it's of course still valid here. I mean, here we have the experimental confirmation. We are sure it's valid here. And somehow it's not obvious what it could be that um, somehow would make such a transition because quite obviously these objects and even objects here consist of individual particles of of elements which are themselves of course correctly described by quantum theories so the molecules and the atoms of the cat certainly obey quantum theory so why should the cat itself not obey quantum theory so the question is somehow first of all before we can explore this what could make a difference as we move to larger objects? And here there are, of course, many ideas around. Here in this talk, 
I somehow take what I call an information theoretic approach. What does this mean, an information theoretic approach? So in information theory, I mean, information theory is about, of course, a lot of information measures, entropies. What I mean here, however, is the very basic idea behind information theory, which is that we try to describe objects um, from an observer's perspective and ask ourselves about this, about the information information contain this description. So in other words, we are not only interested in the objects that are described, but also by the agents who are describing the objects and, and are asking ourselves what information they have. Now, a basic idea, which is, you could say, the main idea behind all what I'm going to present today is what is described here on the bottom, which is somehow um, in short um, or summarized the idea to say that and um, we can of course use quantum theory to describe certain objects like a spin particle but in this setup we have a situation where quantum theory is applied to describe someone who could herself apply quantum theory so you see here this person let's call her alice and alice has here two roles on the one hand, Alice is a user of quantum theory. She carries or she holds information about something, some particle that is out there in the world. Let's call it R. So this is indicated by this bubble. That's what Alice does. But there could be another agent, another user of quantum theory. Call him Wigner, as you will see, this makes sense to call him like that, who considers this whole box that is drawn here on the left as a big quantum system. So from the viewpoint of Wigner, Alice is just a quantum system. So we have now this kind of double role of Alice. Alice as someone who is described as an object by quantum theory, but at the same time, see, she is a subject who describes other objects. And then we can ask a new question. If we now consider this double role, we get obviously certain consistency constraints, I mean, this is maybe not completely obvious, but as you will see, we get certain consistency constraints and we can ask ourselves whether quantum theory fulfills them. So I will explain them in a minute, but maybe just to give you a kind of overview of what that means in terms of this um, little picture I showed before. So if you are asking ourselves what could be different in this area of macroscopic objects, why could it be that quantum theory is invalid here? then maybe a reason could be that these objects here are complex or large enough so that they could themselves act as users of quantum theory. So clearly a single molecule or an atom cannot itself apply quantum theory, but Alice here can. And maybe that makes it impossible to describe Alice at the same time as an object within quantum theory. So, so that's, can I ask you a question at this point? Yes, oh. sure, yes. Sorry, just at this big picture level literally big picture. So mm -hmm. um, another part of this diagram might be the, the observable universe where there's a very good theory of the origin of all structure as quantum mechanical. So mm -hmm. I'm referring to, you know, the evidence in the CMB and how it mm -hmm. um, gets yes. beautifully with, uh, with the origin mm -hmm. of structure as being um, dominated by the variance of some early universe quantum fields. And then later nonlinear evolution producing all the structure that we see, including ourselves who interpret all of this in terms of quantum theory. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. it's not just tiny atoms within objects that are fitting with empirically with quantum mechanics, but also, in fact, the most macroscopic things that we mm -hmm. see yes. are at, at the level that I was just summarizing. So somehow you want to preserve those aspects of quantum theory which are very macroscopic as well as the very microscopic mm -hmm. ones while at the same time somehow mucking with it in the in the intermediate scales. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, so that's a very good point. So first of all, maybe I should say I, in, my wish would be to preserve everything of quantum series. I don't want to give it up, but actually the, um, this information theoretic approach that I mentioned may, is only in some way vaguely um, connected to size. I made this connection here, I suggested this connection by saying, okay, complex object, one that can act as a user quantum series is usually a larger object. But you're of course right that there are aspects on this um, diagram which are here, which have been 
tested and verified to be quantum mechanical. Maybe these are um, um, these are experiments that at least show that certain aspects are relevant here. But now one could argue that in this, let's say, if, if I take here the top part of the diagram and ask myself, could these systems or these things for which quantum theory has been confirmed, like the cosmic microwave background or so, itself act as a user of quantum theory. Then you see this connection between size and scale is not um, quite right. So in- oh, Sorry, sorry, in I, won't way, I won't belabor this, but let me just say that the seeds for structure are very simple, but then they evolve non-linearly into the things that, that are able mm -hmm. to formulate these questions. So mm -hmm. I'm mis I mean, you know, one, one evolves into the other, so- um, that's a question I, I'm going to hang on to as you go, but yes, okay. I'm not sure how easy it is to separate the two. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anyway, I'll, I'll stop now. Okay, Thanks. yes, maybe I would suggest we, we may come back to that once you see the argument in more detail, and then we can see what this could mean for that. So let me first, okay, maybe I'll erase that again. I wanted to, so let me first um, explain to you a, a very old thought experiment that you may probably already have heard of, which is the Wigner's friend thought experiment. A very rough description could be this is like Schrödinger's cat experiment, where the cat is just replaced by a human. But okay, it, it doesn't actually matter whether it's that or not. Let me just briefly describe what it is. So the idea is that we have an observer, Alice, who is situated in an isolated box. So we assume for the moment that this is perfectly isolated. That's of course a bit unrealistic in practice, but we are obviously talking here about thought experiments. Now let's suppose that Alice measures a spin particle, which is initially prepared in a state. Okay, let me call that state maybe spin right. And by convention, this could be a superposition of spin up and spin down. I will just omit here normalization factors to make the notation less crowded. And let's suppose she measures that in the up-down basis. So this little box here on the bottom indicates a measurement device, and let's suppose it's this up-down basis. Now, the now we, we could ask ourselves, how would Wigner describe what's going on in this box. Now, one assumption that is typically made in quantum mechanics or one statement actually of the formalism of quantum mechanics is that if a system, whatever it is, is isolated, then the evolution of the system can be described by a unitary. Now, one thing we know about the evolution of the system is the following. Let's suppose that the particle in the box was not spin right, but was spin up. So I indicate that with a little arrow up. And now let's also describe the other ingredients or the other content of the box as a quantum system. So one of these are, is of course Alice. And let's suppose before the measurement, she doesn't know, of course, what the outcome is. So she, she may somehow in her brain have somewhere the thought, um, I'm ready to measure. So that just describes, should be a summary of the state um, of Alice and everything around her before the measurement starts. Now, this arrow um, should indicate time evolution. During the measurement, something happens. And at the end of the measurement, let's suppose it's a non-destructive measurement, the spin particle will still be in state up because it's a measurement in the up-down basis. And Alice will kind of be able to make the claim, or she will think that she observed um, up. Let's say she says that. I observed that the spin was up. That's what she thinks. And of course, analogously, I could do everything with spin down. I'll not copy everything. Um, of course, it will remain in spin down. And Alice will now have the thought that she observed down. Now, the, the thing that Wigner pointed out is that simply by linearity of unitary evolution, if you now have instead the actual superposition, which I call spin right, I shouldn't call it phi, but spin right as above, 
which is just a superposition of up and down, then by this linearity, we will just have a superposition of the two terms I had above. Let me just abbreviate them. So let's call the total state here that I got here as the state that I call um, lab up. That's just the state of in the entire lab of Alice in the case, in this case, and this one I would call lab down. And now um, I can say that the situation will at the end of the measurement be a superposition of lab up and lab down. That's a um, quite obvious conclusion under the assumption that you assume that under the assumption that this um, evolution is unitary. So that's what Wigner essentially pointed out. His conclusion was the following. He said that this doesn't make sense here because clearly Alice will see a single outcome. We know what happens if we were ourselves, Alice, and we would either observe up or down. And now stating that Alice is somehow in this superposition state or even entangled with the particle R doesn't make sense. Wigner therefore concluded from this that something must be different for observers. So observers cannot be themselves treated as quantum systems. He even said that it's potentially the consciousness of the observers that makes this difference. So today we are, um, I mean, physicists don't really like to talk about consciousness. At least I don't, I mean, I would like to do it, but I simply have no idea what consciousness is. But in the meantime, physicists have developed interpretations of quantum mechanics, and they essentially give answers to Wigner's question, if you want. So the summary of these answers, and this is a very rough summary, and uh, let's say quite simplified one, is, to, is um, shown on this slide. Someone could say that essentially Wigner's contradiction or Wigner's um, claim that there is a contradiction results from the observation that he said that Alice clearly claims in this experiment that either she observed up or she observed down. So I indicated this here by a spin sect measurement. So plus one half stands for up and minus one half for down. And Bob's claim, if he uses unitarity, is that she's in the superposition state. Now, as I said, Wigner would just have said this is wrong. So he would deny this. And this is, by the way, also what, for example, the Copenhagen interpretation would say. They would say Alice is right, she observed an outcome, but Bob is wrong. Because Copenhagen would say that a measurement is always involving a classical system, and that system has to be in a definitive state. And the same is true, for, I mean, I'll just very briefly go through this table. If you don't know about the details of the interpretations, you can later come back to them. It's not that important to understand the rest of the talk anyway, but collapse interpretations would say the same. They essentially um, add to quantum theory a, a decoherence mechanism that would just make sure that Alice really is no longer in a superposition state so that Bob's claim is wrong. Interestingly, there are now um, today many interpretations which claim that actually both are right for different reasons. For example, quantum Bayesianism or today cubism is a theory which says that all these statements are just to be understood as relative statements and they're not, one shouldn't regard them as contradictory. So from Alice's viewpoint, it's correct that she observed either up or down, but at the same time, it's also correct from Bob's perspective to claim that Alice is in a superposition state. In relational quantum mechanics, this is actually compared usually to relativity theory where one says, okay, two different observers have different reference frames. And so it's not surprising if they make different claims, that's perfectly fine. Bohmian mechanics is another approach to quantum mechanics. Here, the situation is different, or the reason is different why there are, um, these two are considered right. Namely, one says that there is an additional hidden variable which says, which um, somehow, contains the information what Alice really observed. So this fact whether she observed plus one half or minus one half is actually encoded in a hidden variable and is a real fact. At the same time, there is still an underlying quantum state which is in a superposition. So for a Bohmian, this is not a contradiction. A system can be in a superposition, but nevertheless has a definite value indicated by these so-called um, hidden variables. 
And in many worlds, they would say Bob is right. There is really this superposition. And Alice's claim, at least in this form, is not right, or there should be somehow an aid here. So she makes both claims at the same time in different branches of the universe. So this is this slide is essential to tell you that there's no agreement at all at all about the answer, even today, because there are proponents of each of these interpretations and very lively debates in um, usually in conferences about the foundations of quantum theory. Now I could ask whether one could bring some clarity to that, that question or whether there's at least something one can do to, in principle, decide who is right. And there was a very clever proposal by David Deutsch, which is an extension of Wigner's friend experiment. And the claim of Deutsch was that at least in principle, we can decide the question who is right. And he, his proposal was to essentially supplement the experiment by two new ingredients. So it's basically the same experiment as before. Alice measures this particle that is prepared in, um, in a superposition of up and down in um, the up-down basis as before. But now, once she has observed an outcome, she sends a note to Wigner. The note only contains the information that she indeed observed the definite outcome. So she doesn't tell Wigner what she observed. She only said, I actually observed a definite value. Notice I did, I'm not in a superposition. By the way, the reason why this is so is that if Alice communicated the value to Wigner, then it would no longer be true anyway that her system would be in a superposition like this, in a coherent superposition. As soon as some information about whether she's up or down is in the environment, she would only be in a mixed state. And then, of course, that would no longer um, be very, um, let's say, surprising in some way. So, but in Deutsch's version, she only communicates a note that she has a definite outcome, but which contains no information about the actual outcome. And so, according to quantum theory, even after in sending out this note, she's still in a superposition state. The second addition that um, Wigner proposed, uh, that Deutsch proposed, was to say, let's just measure Alice's lab in a superposition basis. I call this, or I will later call this, the Deutsch basis. What I mean by that is that one basis element is essentially lab up plus lab down. And the other basis element would be just the other um, coherent addition of the two, lab down. So these are two basis elements, this one and this one. And obviously, if Alice was indeed in that state, lab up plus lab down, you would always get that outcome corresponding to this measurement instrument here, and never that one. Conversely, if Alice actually would decohere and be either in up or down, then you would equally likely get the outcome corresponding to this measurement element and to this one. So you could experimentally decide whether Alice's lab is indeed in a superposition state. Now, the problem with this experiment is that even if you do that, you would not somehow see a contradiction. Because as I mentioned before, some interpretations would say that's both fine. So it, it's not a problem if Alice is actually saying that she observed one outcome, but Bob at the same time claims that there is a superposition. They could even verify it but they would never essentially be able to run into a contradiction because as I said before, Alice cannot tell Bob the actual outcome. So the question that this raises, this essentially um, leaves open is the question whether in a more complicated setup or whether it is somehow an ex a further extension of this experiment where we could try and um, where we could get a contradiction in such settings that would show that it's problematic to apply quantum theory to big objects like users of quantum theory. And that was essentially the starting point of our work. And in this work, we need to look at the further, I should say, extension of this experiment proposed by Wigner, actually an extension of Deutsch's version of the experiment, which roughly speaking consists of two copies of what Deutsch did. 
So it involves now four agents. Two of them are in a box, let's say Alice and Bob, and two of them are like Wigner outside and measure the boxes in these Deutsch bases. I will in a few minutes explain in more detail what this is about, what's going on here, but let me just before that make a few remarks. So first of all, you see here the title, um, which essentially already contains the outcome. The out outcome of this experiment will be that indeed we will run into consistency problems if each of these users applies quantum theory and makes predictions and so on. Now, of course, if one makes a claim that quantum theory is um, inconsistent, this provokes a lot of reactions. And um, there was indeed a lot of, I mean, this is just a pile of real letters I got. I got maybe a, by a factor of 100 more emails about this. But maybe the funny thing was that there was one comment, actually in a, in a blog by Scott Aronson, by um, a quantum physicist, Matteo Saro, who, who said that, Okay, what this means is not that quantum theory is inconsistent. It just means that the users of quantum theory cannot consistently decide what quantum theory actually is. Now, this is actually quite serious because it points to the question of can we even make this whole thing precise? So we were talking here about um, observers, about humans, and before even about cats. And at the end, we want this to make this all into a physics question, into a well-defined question that we can argue about without being ambiguous. And the basic idea to do that is to get rid of these human agents and replace them by computers. So what, what do I mean by that? Remember that um, before I said that what or if maybe I should, you could first ask yourself, what does actually an agent do, a user of quantum theory? What a user of quantum theory does, what we do when we apply quantum theory, is that we, of course, have, first of all, we know the rules of quantum theory. Then we usually see a description of the experiment we would like to analyze. And then also we see, of course, measurement data and then make predictions about um, outcomes. And that's something we could also in principle, let a computer do for us. So the idea would be that a computer will just be programmed with the whole quantum formalism, including um, all a description, how it's actually to be applied, then a description of the experiment that it should um, analyze, and of, he would also constantly get the input about observations that are made in the experiment. And then we ask the computer to make predictions. For example, a computer could make the prediction that with 70% probability, the outcome here will be that. So here, this is an example where the prediction is even, let's say with 100% probability, sure, in which case the computer could say, I'm actually certain that the outcome of this measurement will be this and that based on calculations he did. So based on clearly defined rules. The other thing to notice is that the computer now takes again, two roles, like the agent before. But here it's now much more well-defined what that means. So first of all, a computer, as I said before, is an object, is somehow a use, can act as a user of quantum theory. So this is just indicated here by this Schrödinger equation. We can program the computer to apply quantum theory and make prediction. That's kind of a standard thing that we do when we do computational physics, when we essentially let the computer be a user of quantum theory and make predictions. At the same time, or I mean, really always in, in some way, a computer is of course also just an object, a physical object. And therefore it's somehow the object described by quantum theory. Now, if you want to, um, I mean, I, I showed here, or I, I drew here a box because these boxes will be important in Wigner's friend type experiments. Remember I put Alice into an isolated box. Actually with a computer, this is much easier to do. Of course, one could think of really building a box and putting the computer inside. However, you don't need to do that. You could just think of um, 
essentially only the degrees of freedom which carry information of the computer, only those are relevant. So the keyboard and so on, all that is not the relevant thing when I talk about the computer. When I talk about the computer now, in, for the purpose of all what I'm going to say, what is relevant are the information carrying degrees of freedom. Essentially, it's memory and it's processing unit. Now, what does it mean to perfectly isolate the information carrying degrees of freedom of a computer? If you think about it, then you quickly realize that this is something that is actually done today in many labs worldwide. Namely, everyone who tries to build a quantum computer, first of all, has to perfectly isolate the information carrying degrees of freedom of, of that quantum computer. Or in other words, a qubit is in some way some physical system that um, can take two values, like a classical one, which in addition is, however, perfectly isolated from the environment so that you can use coherence. And so this just means that putting a computer into a perfectly isolated box is actually something we could do even today or very soon at least when we build quantum computers. So it's something we can really think about more realistically than when we talk about humans and cats in boxes, where one could always say, oh, this doesn't really work. There may be even fundamental reasons why this doesn't work. So that's a well-defined thing, so to speak. So here this is indicated by saying now that the computer or the information carrying degrees of freedom of the computer obey, um, for example, the Schrödinger equation. Okay, so why is this interesting? For the purpose of the thought experiment that I'm presenting here, it will be interesting that we can now use computer in, computers in a nested way, analogously to what happened in the Wigner's friend experiment. So you see this blue computer is fed, let's say here, with a description of a, let's say, a spin particle, and then the computer can make predictions about measurements on the spin particle. But now we could have a more complicated situation. We could then take another computer, a green one, and feed it with everything that was going on here on the top as another big experiment. So in other words, the, this um, procedure that a computer is fed with this input and then makes a prediction about the spin is itself a big experiment that I could describe and feed into the green computer. So in other words, the green computer reasons about how the blue computer uses quantum theory to describe um, a spin particle. So you have kind of a nested use of quantum theory. So again, this is maybe the important thing to realize. The green computer applies quantum theory to analyze how the blue computer uses quantum theory. Of course, that should be allowed. So you could also think of this as follows. If you have any theory, not only quantum theory that is supposed to be a universal theory of physics. Then, of course, because the users of the theory are necessarily also part of the physical world, you need to satisfy the criterion that such a nested use doesn't lead to contradictions. Otherwise, the theory cannot be universal. So that's, in some way, a very generic criterion that you can immediately apply to any theory you come up with. If it doesn't satisfy this criterion, it cannot be a universal theory. And the thought experiment is a test of that. So it, it creates a kind of very intricate or complicated situation with the goal of actually bringing this to a contradiction. So now we, as we replaced humans by computers, this was a very nice picture actually drawn by Nuria Nurgalieva, who is a member of my research group has now to be replaced by this maybe not so elegant picture, but maybe physically more appropriate picture where all the agents are now programmable computers. And now the experiment, essentially the thought experiment, or you could even now think of actually doing it once you have quantum computers that can be perfectly isolated, um, is just to give an instruction to each of these four computers. So for example, the blue computer I mean, in this experiment, the blue computer is instructed with the following. We say that the blue computer should first of all generate a random bit. Actually, how does a computer generate a random bit? It would just prepare a state in a superposition and then measure it. So that's one way it could do it. Then we ask the computer to prepare a spin particle. 
depending on the outcome of the random bit. So I, I think of this random bit as a coin as a, and drawn here. So we just have to rule that, for example, if the, um, if the outcome of the random bit of the, of the coin was heads, then the spin should be prepared as a spin down state and otherwise as a spin right state. So right would be a superposition of up and down as before. Then we tell the computer, once you have done that, send this spin particle to the green computer. So by the way, the, the blue one is in an isolated box, but we have to allow the box to be opened for at least a little while so that this spin particle can be sent out. So as a, in a quantum communication terms, there's a one qubit communication from this box to the other box. And then we tell the blue computer, now please make a prediction of the outcome that the red computer will obtain when he measures the whole lab of the green one. Of course, we will have to describe what the, blue, what the red computer exactly has to do, how he has to measure the lab, but every computer here gets also a description of the entire experiment. So the blue computer knows what the red one will do and can then make a prediction. And similarly, the other computers also get such instructions. Let me just um, explain it also for the others briefly. So for example, the green computer is asked to just, um, first of all, receive the spin that was sent out from the blue one, then measure it in the up-down basis, and then from the outcome, try to infer what the value of this random coin was. I will show what that means in a minute. And then based on that, this is now the interesting part, the green computer here is supposed to infer what prediction the blue computer made about the outcome here of the measurement made by the red computer. This is are all, I mean, this sounds complicated, but the point is that these are all allowed things. You can, of course, I mean, from the green computer viewpoint, the blue one is another system and the green one is allowed to reason about the blue one. And so he can reason about what the blue one thinks would be the outcome. And remember before we told we, the blue one to actually make a prediction about W. So the green one should now just infer what that prediction was. And this now continues. So here, ask yes. a quick question here. Yes, so sure. the, the, um, the particle that the blue computer sent to the red doesn't actually go to the red, it goes to the green instead. Is that accurate? Oh, yes. So, yes. Okay. I wasn't um, a bit quick here. Yes. So the blue computer is supposed um, to send a part. Uh -huh. Yes. To, to send it into the green one. So the spin will go into this box here, into the box containing the green computer. But the red computer will be instructed. We'll see that in two slides from now to measure the green book or the, the whole lab here. So in that sense, the outcome here that the red computer will get will depend on the spin because the spin was of course sent into the, that lab. So the spin goes here, but then this entire system here is measured by the red one. Does this clarify? Yeah, yeah, I, I misunderstood, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So um, sorry, when, when you said um when you said that yeah. green is allowed to infer the bit value, does green have to make a definite guess or can green say something like I I guess with 50% probability that the that R was one yes. or zero? Oh uh, thanks a lot for this question. That's a very important question. The green should just do whatever quantum mechanics will tell him to do. So if quantum mechanics will somehow whatever say that actually this outcome will be with probability 50%. Um, whatever that and with 50% that, then the computer should make exactly that statement. So he's only supposed to make a definitive statement if quantum mechanics makes a definitive statement in that situation. However, we will see that um, we will only be interested in definitive statements for our analysis. So we'll just ignore the other ones. But in principle, we would be able to or allow to make any statement. The yellow one, and um, will actually now apply a measurement to this entire lab. So that's the first thing the computer is instructed to do in a, this Deutsch basis that I mentioned before. So this lab will actually be itself in a superposition as seen from the outside, because remember 
that this coin here, this is a random coin, but what it actually is, is a superposition of, of two states that was measured. So from the outside, this just then um, is somehow in a superposition state. And I can therefore define the Deutsch basis in a similar way as I mentioned this before. So the details here are not relevant on this level on which I want to explain it. If you're really interested to do the full calculation, I refer you to the paper. I will just here essentially try to give the idea of how this argument works. I will actually go quite far, so the argument will not be more complicated. You just have to verify a few things. And I will now not give the explicit basis here, but it's essentially this Deutsch basis. Then based on this outcome, this outcome will actually be correlated to what the green computer has. Because, of course, the green computer did something depending on, on this spin, and this spin depends on R, and, of course, this outcome depends on R. So there will be some correlation, and the yellow computer will be able to, therefore, make some inf not completely uninformative statement about the outcome obtained by the green computer. And then, again, the yellow is instructed to actually infer the prediction that the green computer made for the final measurement of the red. And then the yellow one just sends this prediction to the red one. The red has actually the simplest task. It just is supposed to read the prediction for this value made by the yellow computer and then actually carry out this measurement about which we were talking before. So this is again a measurement in the so-called Deutsch basis. So that's so, on a sorry, just to ask a formal it. level what the experiment should looks like. Yes, sorry. You have a question. Sorry, can I ask, ask a question about the previous slide? Yes. This one. So it was said, yes. So you were saying the yellow computer uh, tries to infer the prediction made by green. Um, yes. But so the green computer is, well, the, the whole lab contained the green computer is in some superposition of mm -hmm. different states of the green computer. What does it mean but to infer the prediction made oh, if it's in some a, superposition state? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Actually, um, yes, yeah, so there, di there, there are different ways to answer it, but it will turn out for the one that, um, okay, I mean, one way you, you could answer it is to say that let's just interpret that the prediction as the prediction of if I went there and asked the green computer what was actually your prediction, what will it be? And then it will, of course, be one of them. So the statement about, so you should understand the statement about the prediction made by green as the statement uh, if the yellow really went there and asked the green and then it should okay so if you measured it in the non-superposition basis if you didn't measure it in the uh Wigner basis if you measured it in the like basis yes. of definite states for green okay so um actually i forgot to say something important so you see these four computers here and there is actually a timing issue which is extremely important for this whole thing to make sense. So we assume that there's a very particular time order in which these things happen. And the time order is essentially going from left to right. So first the blue computer does whatever it is supposed to do, what I described before. Then the green computer does its set of instructions. And then after that, the yellow computer does um, performs its own instructions. And only after that, at the very end, the red one um, makes the final measurement. So if you're now asking yourself ourselves, what does the yellow computer, um, what are the statements of the yellow computer? These statements are issued before this box has been measured by the red one. So this box can indeed be in general in a superposition, but we, we can ignore for the moment this measurement here. So we can forget that and just say, the yellow one now tries to make a prediction of what is the state or what is the prediction made by the green one, as I said, in this sense that if I went there and asked. However, actually, it turns out that for our um, to get the contradiction, we are only interested in predictions which hold with certainty. So it um, so the question is a very valid one, but it will actually not arise because um, the yellow one will only make a statement in the case where, from his viewpoint, the green one is actually not in a superposition. So, um, so the first answer I gave would be kind of how I would answer it in general, but the problem doesn't actually arise. And I will just, um, okay, yeah, so 
maybe as a, as a very rough explanation, if you really calculate the state of the green one conditioned on a particular outcome here, then it turns out that this state here will actually have a definite value for Z. So there's not a superposition in Z. This just turns out um, from the calculation, or this comes out of the calculation. And if you like, I can maybe at the end um, come back to this and show you that calculation. But I would I'm prefer gonna... to first continue with, with um, let's say, the, on, on the higher level. Would it be accurate to say that what's happening here is that the green computer applies some unitary gate that is this this thing you're saying that's the guess right the green makes a guess as to what the bit was um that's applying some unitary gate and then in measuring yellow applies some other gate on this enlarged system that somehow introduces entanglement that is inconsistent with green's original prediction yeah so it's certainly true that always from the outside viewpoint what these computers do is to somehow um essentially apply unitary or the description of whatever they do this will be described by unitary and this unitary contains all their reasoning processes including the prediction so that's right now the entanglement there will actually be at some point entanglement between for example the blue one and the green one this already happens very early when the blue one sends um, the the spin to the the green one because there's no because this is just a coherent spin, it, they will, um, after that step, the two will be entangled. So maybe I would also come back to that question a bit later when we have seen how these measurements um, work, because some of them may immediately be answered when you see how the analysis goes. So let me actually show yeah. how we Renato, analyze. I this. wanted to take this moment to say we are at the 50 minute mark and I don't want to rush you, but I saw that mm -hmm. you still like, uh, like half the slide, so just, Yes, okay, I, I think I can go, go quite far. Let me maybe um, go forward and then um, I'll um, we take then at the end some questions and I can go quite fast from here on. So actually what, um, okay, now explain what the four computers are doing. Now, and this was still not very precise because I just said they are somehow programmed with some rules. And the only thing I now need to say is what are these rules that the computers really execute? And one rule, and maybe the most important one, is that each computer really applies quantum theory. However, I don't use everything from quantum theory, and this may answer several of these questions. I only need um, quantum theory in the particular case where it gives probability one predictions. And this is the case um, in an experiment where, for example, if I have some state psi, apply unitary and then a measurement um, described by projectors. If psi and then the uni apply, apply to it and the projector has norm one, then this tells us that um, in this experiment, I, cert I get with certainty the outcome associated to this projector. So in other words, one rule we program the computer with is to say that calculate this norm and then um, if it's one, output this statement. And if it's not one, don't do anything. So we are not interested in probabilistic predictions. Then just say, I cannot make um, a prediction. And OK, let me skip on that. I just wanted to say that unitarity is usually applied in many things, like when we analyze black hole information paradoxes and so on. But let me come to the, another important rule, which is the rule that I call C, which so we somehow need a rule how a computer can admit the prediction made by another one. And now this is this recursive view. So suppose the green computer has actually figured out that the blue computer came to the conclusion that it's certain that an outcome is, let's say, set. Then the green computer can just admit that as, or you could say, and um, somehow promote this to his own conclusion. So this would mean in, um, in let's say, more pictorial terms that if one of my PhD students who I know uses the same rules for quantum theory as I do, and I know for some reason that he has arrived at a certain outcome, then I can take over that result without actually myself doing the computation. Of course, this is all, if these are all computers, it's even less of a risk that someone makes an error here. So it's not about us. This is just the rule which um, is very natural if you are all programmed with the same computers. And then the final rule is a very obvious one, 
it if it happens that using these other rules one arrives at contradictory claims for example it claim that one is certain that the outcome is set but one is also certain that it's not set then one should say okay i have to stop here the rule set um, i was programmed with is just not good now this is um, these rules are now applied and i will now because we are short on time just um show one example of of this application so um, as I said, sorry, uh, the blue I, I didn't want to like uh, extremely. We can go like about ten minutes over, so we don't have to finish okay, on the that's hour. That's fine. Mark, yes. So, yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Thanks. I thought we have to end very soon. No, no, but no. Then we I, are, no, I can no. explain that. We can so. go. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so let's um, remember that um, the blue, blue computer is instructed to uh, to generate this random coin, which is either tails or heads, and if it's tails. He's instructed to prepare a spin right state. If it's tails, eh, sorry, if it's tails, he has to do that. If it's heads, he's instructed to prepare a spin down state. That's just um, what the experiment prescribes. This is just for, to, for you to remember. Now let's um, um, also remember, or I will also want to remind you that the green one just measures in the up down basis. Now, like in the Wigner's friend experiment, we do, um, or in Deutsch's version of the Wigner's friend experiment, um, the red computer measures the entire lab here. And actually, if you, for the moment, ignore the yellow computer, then in the case where the blue computer got outcome R equal tails and therefore prepares a spin right, we are essentially exactly in the same situation as in the Deutsch version of the Wigner's friend experiment. Remember the Deutsch version of the Wigner's friend experiment, we are once one, um, the friend actually measures a spin right particle in the up down basis, and then Wigner from the outside measures the whole thing in this Deutsch basis. Now this, for this analysis, so to ask what is now the outcome here, we can, we should, according to quantum theory, treat whatever happens here um, in the friend's box, in the green computer's box, um, as a unitary. And by linearity and so on, we find, like in, in my description of the Deutsch experiment, that this lab will be in a superposition state. And if we now measure this lab in a superposition state in, this, in the Deutsch basis, then we will get an outcome, one particular outcome. Remember, um, I had one measurement element, which was lab up plus lab down. That was um, um, the state of the lab. And if we now say that if this happens, we call this outcome fail. That's just the name for the outcome. So the outcome of, of this measurement will therefore with certainty be fail. We just constructed it like that. So you could also say that the outcome we call fail is just the one that corresponds to the state of this system if it was fed with a spin right state here. And of course, the blue computer knows all that because it's fed with a description of the experiment. So if the blue computer got here tails and therefore prepared a spin right, the blue computer can make this prediction that it is certain that the outcome here will be fail. So that's like the role. It, so the blue computer does the same thing as we did when we analyzed the Deutsch experiment and just makes this prediction that if quantum mechanics is correct, the blue one, uh, the red one will measure fail. Now the situation is more interesting if you look at the green computer. Let's suppose the green computer got the state spin up. What can the green computer conclude from that? Remember that if we got here um, up, because the spin was either prepared in spin right or spin down. Um, and uh, it's very easy to see that if you get spin up, it cannot have been the preparation of spin down because that's orthogonal to spin up. So if you measure spin up, it can only result from the blue computer having prepared spin right corresponding to R equal tails. So in other words, if you are the green computer and see spin up, you can with certainty say that the blue computer got R equal to tails. But we already said before, that was what we just analyzed a few slides ago, 
that if the blue computer saw tails, it could predict with certainty that the outcome of the red computer was failed. So you see how these things are kind of chained. So the green computer is now certain that the blue computer is certain or that the blue computer got tails. And therefore the green computer is certain that the blue computer came to the conclusion that the red computer will observe fail. Now we apply the other rule, the consistency rule, which says that now the green computer can promote this prediction by the blue computer to his own prediction and just say, okay, now I'm certain that the blue computer will observe fail. Now this proceeds for the others. And, and actually, as I said before, a calculation, which I will now not show, but I can show it maybe at the end, if there's time after the question in the question session, the yellow computer will, if it ob obtains the outcome, okay, there will also be two outcomes and one is labeled okay. If that outcome occurs, the yellow computer can infer with certainty that the green computer um, got outcome plus one half and therefore concluded that the red one will observe fail. So it's again one of these chain statements. And again, the yellow computer can apply the consistency rule to conclude that it is now certain about what the value of W of this um, measurement by the red one will be. So what we have found so far is that whenever the yellow computer gets this outcome, which I labeled okay, it can by this chain reasoning conclude that the red one will observe fail. And he will just communicate that to the red one. So the red one now knows, oh, I will actually observe fail because the yellow one, which was programmed with the correct rules of quantum theory, told me that I will observe fail. However, we can now, I mean, this was now kind of an indirect reason. So remember, we, blue arrives at this by somehow believing the yellow one. But we could now also directly calculate how likely is it that the yellow will observe okay and the red one will also observe okay. And it turns out the calculation which will show that this happens with a certain positive probability probability 112. So with pro well, probability 112, something worrying happens. Namely, it happens that the yellow computer will conclude using the rules we described with certainty that the red one will observe fail. And the red one will, of course, have to promote that conclusion to his own. Nonetheless, the red one will actually observe okay. So we are now in a situation where the red one said, I'm actually certain that I will have failed that because the yellow told me so, but I observed okay. So I'm also certain it's okay because I just observed it. And that's of course a contradiction. So the red one will now say, our set of rules we were programmed with was contradictory. So we have to give up one of these rules. So before I conclude, let me just remind you what these rules were. So the the idea was we had all these computers. Each computer was programmed with essentially three rules. One is that if it analyzes an experiment going on somewhere outside of itself, and if and then um, it can just apply quantum theory to describe it and, and without the collapse model, so things are unitary. Then if, and the other rule said that if some, someone comes to a certain conclusion and I know that I can, take over that conclusion. And the third rule was that I should essentially ring an alarm bell if, if I reach a, um, a contradiction. And the claim is now this will actually happen. So that's essentially the main point of my presentation. So we have seen that it's somehow problematic to assume these rules simultaneously. And of course you could now question, I mean, that's the whole point of, of this statement that Obviously it was a bad idea to assume all these three because they are contradictory. The challenge is however, to somehow give them up in a reasonable way. We don't just want to completely abolish, for example, the fact that quantum theory is a good description. We also certainly don't want to abolish the fact that we can take over conclusions of others because otherwise we would be in a completely solipsistic world if we would say that statements that others made are not valuable or cannot be used in any way. So one would, if one gives up these rules, one would maybe want to weaken them, but not to abolish them. Okay, 
before I um, have my my final thank you slide, I just want to mention that this ex this sort experiment is based on many ideas that existed before. Obviously, the Schrödinger's cat experiment and the Wigner's friend experiment, but also bell type experiments as well as an extension of it by Hardy and ideas and um, by Jaslav Bruckner to extend those further, which are very similar to the things I presented here. Okay, so. Again, the conclusion is that if you are ask ourselves what's the validity of quantum theory, we can try to do the, um, this test that we program computers with the laws of quantum theory as we understand them. And then it turns out that this leads to a contradiction, which means that somehow the laws, the way we, we program the computers with, which I explained to you what it means, how I mean what they are, are not a good description of what is going on in this area where um, we have systems that are complex enough so that they could themselves be users of quantum theory. I think that's all. So I would like to thank you for the attention. And um, if you're interested in the, let's say more detailed calculation, I can either show you them now, or you can read them up um, quietly in um, one of these papers that are mentioned here. Actually, this one is not yet available, but um, if you want to read it, just drop me an email and, and I'll send you um, the kind of unpublished version of it. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention and also thanks for the questions during the talk. And I'm of course happy to take further questions. Thanks Renato, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Thank you. Yeah, I guess we have the floor open for questions, if anyone can just unmute and ask. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so in fact, you have like a definite quantum state for the four computers, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, do you, uh, what, what is the, that state looks like? Uh, can I have a, do you have a formula on that? Yes, I actually have a formula for the, let's say big quantum state. I don't, didn't have it written up here, but, um, Okay, what I could do is either open a document where it is in, and maybe uh, I'll... Where, where, maybe maybe where, where part of the paper I can find. Uh... Yeah, may, maybe I can uh, briefly just show it. Maybe it's easier. So there's actually a, a paper by Jeff Bock and um, on this experiment, and I think I can easily find it now. I just need to Google it. So I think, um, yes, it's... Um, Understanding the fraud. Okay, this is obviously the right title. So that's um, uh, the paper I meant. And here in this paper, he has actually done exactly what you're asking for. He has essentially calculated the entire state of the total system involving everything. And I think this is, you see here the formula. So that's somehow the final state. So this little um, psi n. 31, you see the N31 refers to the time in the experiment. So 31 is essentially after um, almost everything is concluded. And you see now the state of course includes somehow the memory states, if you like, of the observers which haven't been measured yet. And what you see is that um, this state now has one branch. I think it's um, and the, the one on the fourth line. I don't think I can draw on this, but on the fourth line of this whole thing, the, the one starting with plus, this is one branch. So if you kind of think in many words, this would be one many words branch. And what this tells you is that in one within one branch, the conclusions that the um, agents made and wrote down into their internal memories. And here I'm only talking about the two um, agents that were drawn on the right, because the others have been measured. And um, as actually Scott Aronson pointed out, we shouldn't talk about the memory content of measured agents. But at the end, we still have the agents that I called U and W, which are called here W bar and W in this paper. And so the state just contains one branch where the conclusion is inconsistent. So essentially, um, I mean, that's you didn't ask explicitly for that, but that's the state. And the, 
the way you see the contradiction within that state is that if you look into the state and read what the branches mean, then there is one branch with, with a weight of square root of one over 12 within which the agents have arrived at wrong conclusions or contradictory conclusions. So if you read here on the right hand side of the fourth line of this formula, you see that the conclusion that the agent has in its memory is that it's certain that W is fail, but now you observe W equal OK. So that's what, what you can do. So this is somehow a many worlds analysis, if you like, of the whole experiment, in which case the contradiction is just in one branch of the many worlds um, state. So, so in other words, uh, you are saying uh, if we do experiments, then if we uh, in this uh, in this uh, state like mm -hmm. uh, OK bar and uh, fail, we will have two computers give opposite conclusions, right? Yes, One right. Fail so, and success. right. So, and um, yes, if you really carried out the experiment, you would just program the computers with these rules. And at the end, at the very end, you read out what the computers concluded and you will see that they with certainty um, kind of concluded the opposite. I mean, in, in the, the way I do it in my experiment is actually that the two computers themselves combine the knowledge. So the yellow one sends his conclusion to the red and the whole contradiction is already contained in the red one. But that's right, what you're saying is, that's what you would see. But maybe that's okay. I mean, why do we do we need uh, these two computers have the uh, agree on each other? Maybe yes. I mean, what? that's right. So um, that's a, a, a good point. I mean, the question is: Is this okay <laughs> somehow? And if you look at the um, the almost last slide I had again, these rules and. Is a, the reason why it's not okay according to my thought experiment is because there is this kind of rule here, the last one, which say don't complain alternative facts. So if I mean if they combine their knowledge, they shouldn't. So this this is an explicit assumption, essentially saying it's not okay. If you are now saying okay, maybe it's okay, then this would just be equivalent to giving up this last rule and say okay. Um, let's not care, let's, let's not worry if that happens, in which case you no longer have, I mean, is it, it's not a logical contradiction to say that I'm certain that, um, uh, let's say my, my pen here is yellow and I'm also certain it's black, it's just um, something that doesn't maybe make much sense, but logically I can be certain of two things. And this last rule here says, no, we don't want this. And, and because the whole point of my talk is that these three rules are incompatible. You're absolutely right that we are even forced to give up one of them. And so you could say, okay, your solution would be to give up the last one. That's a um, perfectly valid solution. Of course, the interesting question is now, why? Why, should, why, do you, why would one think that this last one, um, one would one be more ready to give up that one rather than this one, because it's, of course, um, kind of still unsatisfactory to say that um, we have a theory where at the end we have to accept that conclusions that are at the end communicate. I mean, remember the two computers can at the end communicate, the yellow one and the red one. So we can talk to each other and we, are, we both can agree that we applied the theory correctly, but we, are, we got different outcomes, actually um, contradictory outcomes. To me, this doesn't sound very satisfactory, but that's one solution. So actually, this whole argument doesn't tell us at all which of these rules is problematic. And that's somehow a next possible research project to somehow find Classic. other sort of experiments that give us hints which one of those we may want to give up. May I ask a question? Sure. Hello? Yes, uh, sure. Well, first of all, um, this is Leonard Susskind. Yes. I find it very interesting, and I would ask you to send me an email with all of the with the names of the papers that uh, that address this whole question. But uh, here's my question: mm -hmm. uh, the usual picture of the sort of many worlds evolution is that the state of a system branches like a tree, yes. with no closed loops. Mm -hmm. 
when this kind of experiment is done, in which the first experiment is done in one basis, let's say Wigner's basis, and the next piece of the experiment is done where somebody measures in a uh, another basis. What, what did you call the other basis? Uh, oh, the, the Deutsch yeah, basis. The Deutsch basis, yes, right, yes. It's not clear to me that when you do that, that the, uh, the things branch in the same way, in the same... Uh, uh, that, uh, that the branching takes place in this tree-like structure without sort of closed mm -hmm. loops in it. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Is this a phenomenon that is connected with that kind of, um, with that in particular, with the fact that the tree-like branching is not, uh, which always occurs if you continuously measure in the same basis, mm -hmm. that this is the kind of thing that, will, that uh, may occur only when uh, the many world sort of breaks down because things which were done become undone. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a question. I, yes, I think, um, so let me, before answering, make a remark. Um, in the discussion, which I mentioned maybe before even we started the recording here, um, I mentioned that I, I discussed it with Scott Aronson and he had, a very similar comment and he mm. was essentially saying maybe the rule should be that if we do an experiment in which this this tree that you just mentioned is yeah. not only branching but again um kind of merging in certain yeah. places yeah. which always happens in these Wigner's or deutsch versions of the experiment right. that's the right. generic feature of them then we should not apply the usual rules that was essentially his conclusion. He said, okay, okay that's, that's happens, also, that's also just not that would also be my conclusion. And it's, uh, it's, yeah. of course, we still want to have a theory which also works then. So in, oh, in some way, one solution yeah, yeah. could be if you are happy to only analyze situations in which the tree is really only a tree in the yeah. traditional sense with no, I mean, the trees I have in front of my yeah. house, they have no loops. And so then um, I think this problem cannot arise. That's right. That's, and and you're right that we need some new insight into the way to use the rules when uh, when the branching gives way to uh, I'll, I'll just call them closed yes, loops. Yes, yes. Yeah. So in some way, you could also understand this result that I presented just as the statement essentially that the current understanding we have of how to use quantum theory doesn't apply to these situations where the tree is no longer a tree and we yeah. have to invent something new. Now, the problem is I have tried, and of course, not only me, but um, many of, of those who were already kind of alarmed by this fact, um, also partially due to the SOT experiments, there are lots of works, um, to somehow come up with alternatives with such additional rules. Yeah. Now, there is actually one problem, which I, I even have a kind of um, slide I once made because um, there was a similar question. If I mean, there's kind of a challenge now, and the challenge is the following. Try to um, come up with modified rules. Um, we still want to program our computers with rules. With the following property, one property should be that the contradiction I just explained doesn't arise. Of course, that's an obvious um, thing we want. But this actually turns out to be very easy because you can just say, let's, for example, say that quantum C or that and um, consistency rules, that which I called C, is only applicable if everything, if all observers agree on one big classical basis, so to speak. Yeah. Um, there's kind of a yeah. unique understanding what is our basis, and then, of course, this merging cannot happen. But this will be, so therefore, the challenge would not be difficult if, if I just ask you to um, essentially avoid the contradiction. But it becomes very challenging when we um, ask the following try to. Um, avoid the contradiction here, but still don't restrict the rules so much that standard experiments we do. And the standard experiment is even one where, for example, I just go to a lab, actually I'm not very good as an experimentalist, but suppose I go to a lab and just measure a spin particle, because, um, I mean, just to give you an example, as I said, some people are saying, Okay, maybe the rules only apply if we are actually in a classical basis. But of course, if I go to a lab and measure a spin, which is in a superposition, then from your viewpoint, I'm now already in a superposition. 
So the rule would already not apply and you could not make statements about it, which would be unsatisfactory because that's just the standard situation that I go to the lab and measure the speed. And now you could say, okay, as long as we don't somehow now communicate or as long as we only communicate once I told you what the outcome is or once you don't look at the purifying system, then things are still okay. So we can extend the rules, but it's very, it's, it turns out to be very difficult to somehow adapt the rules to make them not and um, so to make them restrictive enough so that this contradiction doesn't arise, but at the same time, not so restrictive that there are very simple situations we can actually think of, which are very daily life situations where they don't us for, forbid us to use quantum theory. And that's what we somehow want. That's a challenge, which I haven't seen a solution to. And, and that's is, really what worries me since two years, let's say. Is there a, um, is it enough to relax the, consistency condition so that mm -hmm. you have to accept as truth somebody else's conclusion if yes. they can like broadcast it there's actually a very interesting recent paper by chris fuchs and and others and who proposed exactly that so they said i mean they're of course worried because in cubism all these um statements seem to be i mean all these assumptions seem to be valid because obviously in, in cubism you assume that quantum theory is correct and you you also don't want to claim alternative facts but then he said actually in cubism maybe because we are in quantum mechanics if two agents talk to each other they shouldn't just do the obvious thing so if i if you, i tell you i'm sure i got this outcome you shouldn't take this over and they proposed somehow um a criterion which is however not a very precise one in my opinion, uh, they even admit that they say it's kind of a bit vague to essentially weaken that and say this rule doesn't universally apply, it only applies in certain situations. And of course, if you now define the situations in which it applies exactly in such a way that, um, again, this contradiction here doesn't arise, then you have resolved it. Now the question is, isn't this restriction then again so restrictive that in many daily situations we would no longer be able to talk because the rule would also no longer apply because let's say you tell me something and i would say now we are that's clear i should just i mean if i believe that you are using theory correctly i should just be able to take that over and now the rule would maybe say yes but this is only allowed to do if all we ever saw was kind of measured in the same basis so there should be nothing that from my viewpoint is in a superposition which from yours isn't well and is it course, enough like if we forget about the basis but just say that um if the agent whose conclusion we're supposed to trust is stuck in a box then we don't need to trust it but if they are outside and in principle could communicate the result like to infinity then we need to trust it yes um actually um yes this may be um it's a bit related to um, what Leonard Susskind just um, mentioned about the branching, because if we are essentially making the assumption that people are um, communicating stuff far out into space so that it never can be accessed again, then this in practice means that the tree only branches and never merges again. And then we are again in a situation where the, the problem doesn't arise. So that's yeah. right, absolutely right. However, I personally don't find this very convincing. So I gave this um, initial motivation also with the black holes and, and throwing Alice into the black hole. And this is, of course, then an isolated system and she doesn't communicate things far out. So I want to be able to analyze situations where there are indeed isolated systems that I want to consider um, without the communication into some region, which then I define to be inaccessible. But this would be a solution indeed. And I think this was also, again, I mentioned Scott, he somehow proposed that, that whenever he measures something, we can only count this as a measurement if he somehow threw some part of the measurement outcome into a place into the universe that is never going to be accessible. And um, then again, the problem is avoided. So this is really a solution which I just personally don't find satisfactory because it essentially just defines the problem away by saying, don't consider isolated systems only also always make sure the relative relevant information leaks out. Yeah. Hello? So from the, um, <clears throat> the, the Everettian point of view, the, the rules of quantum mechanics from one perspective are very clear. You just have uh, 
there's a Hilbert space and there's a Schrodinger's mm -hmm. equation and that's everything there is. So from that point of view, would it be correct to say that the question here is um, what, how do we interpret, when do we interpret a state as one of classical certainty? So, or is that, so it's a, it's a question of interpreting states, but precisely mm -hmm. what is the, from mm -hmm. that point of view, what's the precise question that we're, or, or contradiction? Yes. Yeah, so if you're uh, a happy yeah. Everettian and you're happy with the Schrodinger equation, then, then what's, what's still a puzzle? Oh, so if you are an Everettian and happy with the Schrodinger equation, what's the problem? Yeah. Okay, then I think the, the, the problem is really the, the, what I said before with this big quantum state. So if you are Everettian, you really actually do this calculation that I um, just showed before and you arrive at this state that is shown here. And then I think you should be worried because just um, you now read from the state that there is a branch in which the agent makes a contradictory statement. So I think that's the worry in that case. So now, it's a question of interpreting classical certainty and what are the, then the rules that are obeyed yes, by yes. that. Yes, now you could say, what does it mean certainty? to be certain within a branch, so to speak? But um, actually, um, yes, there was a lot of, discussion about that, and which is also actually covered in this same paper by Jeff Bob on um, what certainty means. But very roughly speaking, I could um, say the following. So whatever notion of certainty you have, actually each of these rules involves the term certainty. For example, it occurs here when we say that if according to the Born rule, the probability of a certain outcome is equal to one, then we say um, that the, the agent could now say, I'm certain about it. So there it's just um, defined to be essentially the one of the Born rule. Then we say the consistency rule, you see here that certainty also occurs because the consistency rule essentially says that um, if it, we only want to be, um, to promote this knowledge if you are certain about something. So certainty also occurs there. And certainly also occurs in this rule S that you shouldn't make um, or arrive at contradictions. Now you can say whatever notion of certainty you're using, think of certainty of however you like, as long as the term certainty, as you understand it, satisfies these three rules, you are in trouble. And this was actually again a proposal, I think by actually by Chris Fuchs who said that being certain doesn't mean it's true. So, can't I resolve this whole paradox by just interpreting certainty um, as not being a fact? I think he had this um, example, which was kind of convincing that, um, for example, you could be certain that your wife doesn't cheat you, but it may not be true. So now, um, what does this mean? If you are certain, I mean, um, you, you essentially still need to give up one of the rules. So you come with one, one notion of what you call certainty, but now still the theorem applies. As long as your notion of certainty um, kind of, as long as the assumptions hold in your understanding of certainty. So you could now have a weaker notion of certainty which doesn't fulfill one of the assumptions and then you are done and the problem is solved. So you could phrase the challenge as that, come up with a notion of being certain which is somehow weaker than our usual understanding so that the three assumptions don't all hold. And then for, for you, the contradiction is kind of no longer arising. So maybe the point of all this is to say that I'm not assuming a particular notion of certainty. I'm kind of defining it via the assumptions. I, I tell you, come up, just come with whatever you understand with it. As long as you're happy with the assumptions, I'm also happy with your notion of certainty. So certainty from this Born rule point of view is this is saying that your wave function lies within some particular subspace. Yeah, I mean that's an and then someone is measuring in a different something that's off, that's at an angle to that subspace. But let's say I mean what it would mean to have a different notion would be that let's suppose you do the calculation in quantum mechanics and the uh, probability according to the Born rule is one. And now someone could say my notion of certainty is that even if this happens. I don't claim that I'm now certain that this happens. I would need something stronger. And then of course, um, the problem is kind of resolved. So even then we would say, okay, that means giving up the rule Q. But of course, again, that's not very satisfactory because we could say, I mean, if you 
that cannot interpret the probability one statement as being certain, then you want maybe still to interpret, interpret it as something because otherwise we cannot use quantum mechanics even in daily life situations. Then it just doesn't mean anything. You just get this outcome probability one, but it doesn't tell you are certain. So what do you make out of it? So it would make quantum mechanics unusable. And I think that's really the point. It's the challenge is to give up, to weaken the rules without making quantum mechanics essentially unusable. And and that's I, uh, the trade-off, yes. Yeah, I had a, a question. So it was important that this yellow computer measured the, the blue one. Yes. Before we could derive the contradiction, right? At a time that, in the time mm -hmm. that happened yes, so, before. Yes, there is this timing I mentioned, you're right. I mean, first the blue does right. something, then the green, then the yellow measures the blue, and finally yeah. the red one yeah. uh, measures My question the is, in usual, quantum computation, there is a theorem that you can run all the unitaries first, mm -hmm. and then in the end, do whatever projections we need. Mm -hmm. So how, do, so could we actually recast this thought experiment into that form where all the measurements happen at the very end or no? Um, no, you cannot in this case. And, okay. and I think this is a generic feature of all, I mean, not all of that, but already of the, let's say, Deutsch version of the Wigner's friend experiment. So I could even explain it in the simpler case. So if you look at the Deutsch version, um, then you see the, um, the idea is that first Alice does a measurement and then um, Wigner measures the whole lab of Alice. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we cannot defer Alice's measurement to later. And so the difference to quantum computation is usually that the theorem that you're mentioning only applies if you already have a devoted register that will no longer be touched by anyone else. And then you can say, I mean, if Alice would somehow have a safe register in which um, she would do everything she wants to measure later and keep it, and then at the very end measure, then your theorem would apply. But she cannot do it because she's in this isolated lab and the whole lab will be measured by Wigner. So there is no register in which she can put stuff that she would later measure. I see. So that's really why in these experiments this doesn't work. And I think all these questions are, that I'm now asked are very related because again, this theorem applies essentially if you have this extra register, which again would mean in a many worlds context, in an Everett tree context that the tree only branches because you throw this register into a region where it's never touched again. So it's, it's like sending out mm -hmm. information to the remote part of the universe and then it doesn't matter when you measure that part of the universe whether you do it now or later now in this experiment in these experiments it's very important that alice measures first and then wigner actually alice cannot any longer measure after wigner has measured her because if wigner measures alice in a superposition basis she's probably completely screwed up and this was maybe one thing that was actually very in, i mean yes i think really very misleading in in the um, blog post by Scott Arnson because his title was that, of course, you cannot trust agents who are hot um, which means measured in a superposition basis. And of course, I, I agree with that claim. However, the timing of the experiment is exactly chosen in such a way that this doesn't happen. So um, actually, I said that, for example, the blue computer makes a prediction about the red one. But of course, this prediction is completely lost in a way, once the yellow one has measured the blue one, because the measurement of the yellow computer will completely screw up the blue computer. Nothing will remain of the, of the blue one. So, but the idea of this thought experiment is that um, somehow the measurement outcome of the blue one is before the yellow measured it already known to the green one. Remember the green one knows what the blue one got. And then of course you can now destroy the blue one and this doesn't matter because the measurement outcome that the blue one got is already known to the green one. And the same happens later. So you somehow save the information known by the green one into the yellow one. And now the red one can um, essentially destroy the green one because later you can no longer ask the green one what it had. So this timing is really important. That's something I, I should probably point out. Otherwise the experiment would really not make sense. So all the statements are always statements that are made at a particular time. And you see, I mean, just maybe as a last illustration, if you look at this statement that um, the 
green one makes about the blue. This is really a statement that is made at the time before the blue one was measured. So you could even, the green one could go there to the blue and um, actually, I mean, even here, the, the green one could go to the blue and say, am I correct that you concluded that you are certain that the, uh, the red one will output fail? And of course, um, that verification would always succeed if they did it, I mean, if quantum mechanics is correct. So they're actually in principle verifiable statements. All these statements that the computers derive could in that sense be verified by the computer just going there and ask, am I correct with my conclusion? And um, okay. yes. So, uh, so, oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yes. I have a question basically to reiter reiterate the previous question. So mm -hmm. is it basically the question that whether you have two branches with contradictory information that you somehow merge? Is it the source of the problem? Uh, yeah, I would, I would not um, say what, that I could in any way identify the source of the problem in some way. There are of course, many things happening in this sort of experiment. And if I could identify the source, I would not have three assumptions. So in some way, it's really a chain of things. It's like a proof by contradiction. I have a chain of many things and at the end, I get a contradiction. Of course, at some point, this happens that um, in a certain picture, according to a certain basis, things are merged. This is always, by the way, a basis dependent statement. So already in the, in the Deutsch experiment, you could say that the measurement carried out by Deutsch on this picture here that I had, where I called it the Deutsch um, measurement, um, this measurement somehow merges the two branches of Alice of the two outcomes. So this certainly happens. Mm -hmm. Now you could say, okay, is the problem due to that? It's certainly true that if there was no merging, so this is again what I said before, if the tree is always a tree, then the problem doesn't arise. However, I wouldn't say that this is really just the source of the problem because in the, in the Deutsch version of the Wigner's friend experiment, there is no contradiction arising, despite the fact that we have such a merge. I mean, many of the interpretations were even developed actually to make the point that there is no contradiction there, that this is not the problem, this merging. Right. Is merging a well-defined thing that you can mathematically see, or uh, is it, as you said, is it, you, you said, is this basis dependent? So. Yes. Yeah, so the merging is always some, I mean, like any statement in many worlds, depends on the choice of a basis. And so if I say there's a merging of branches, what I mean is that there are natural basis states defined by Alice's measurement, and these are merged. If you now take Wigner's perspective and say that Wigner doesn't need to care what Alice really did, for, for him it's just some unitary thing, then there's no merging, that's just some measurement. So these statements about merging are, I mean, yeah, I would really generally say that any statement that is made referring to many worlds, one always has to keep in mind is a statement relative to a choice of basis. If I now have more than one agent, then the agents may choose different bases as their natural basis to represent mm -hmm. things. So the state I showed before in Bob's paper is kind of the basis that would be naturally chosen by the final two observers, by the Wigners who are outside. Right. And, yes. I see. So this isn't slightly com more complicated because these different observers can see a different version of branching and, and yes. uh, right. merging. Right. I mean, this is generally the case, as mm -hmm. I said, already in, in this version of the experiment. So whenever um, someone measures someone else and this is not, they didn't agree on the basis in which, so if someone measures me, but didn't know in which basis I was thinking, then we already are in that situation. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. I guess uh, I have another question regarding this mm -hmm. information transfer from the yellow computer to the red computer. Mm -hmm. So actually this, this slide is good because you had this note that was being passed. So the yellow computer basically passes such a note to the red computer with the definite uh -huh. outcome on it. Is that true? Or... Yes. So um, you mean the, in the final thing? So yeah, the yellow the point... computer um, passes a note here, I think. Okay, let's see. 
Yes, here it just passes the node, yes. Yes, so but, uh, this is actually not deterministic. So it could also be, so here I only looked at the case where the yellow computer got this particular outcome. There are actually two possible outcomes. So I didn't really go into detail yeah. here, but essentially this is a measurement in the Deutsch basis. And the Deutsch basis has essentially two possible outcomes. One I just call okay and the other fail. These are just names for it. Now, um, if the outcome was the other one, the one I called fail, then the rules that I had would not allow the yellow computer to make a statement with certainty. And because I only impose that rule, the yellow computer would just say, now I cannot make a prediction. So actually what will happen in this experiment is that only in, I think, um, actually one sixth of the cases, if you do the calculation, the yellow computer will tell the, the red one that um, W will be failing. And in, in, in the all five, six other cases, the yellow computer will just say, actually, I don't know what you will get. I'm uncertain. I don't know whether this was your question, but this is just to say, it's yeah, not yeah. No. Note, um, it's just, yeah. I got some definitive outcome. It's really a note that contains the outcome, which, mm -hmm. or that contains information in the sense that it can be different. So something that is a constant somehow doesn't contain really much information, at least not in the information okay. series sense. So here, this is actually generic information in the sense that it could also not be true. Mm -hmm. Are other questions? I mean, there was a question that I didn't before answer um, completely, but I'm not sure. It's maybe a bit too technical. It was this question about how does the yellow computer make a statement about the green one? Because the green one is in principle in a superposition state. Here, I, maybe I can now say that Actually, if the yellow one gets this outcome, which is the only outcome in which I want the yellow one to make a prediction, then if one does the calculation, one sees that conditioned on that outcome, the, um, the spin that goes in to the, um, to the green one will actually um, be a spin that is with, um, that is with probability one up. So this is maybe a bit surprising because here up spin was never prepared, but because everything is now measured in, in strange basis, this happens. So it turns out, so it's just a calculation conditioned on, okay, the spin here that is measured by the green one is up. And therefore it's clear. I mean, you don't need to talk about branches. You can just say, oh, then I know that based on that um, here, the outcome of the green one is up. There are no superpositions. So that was a question. How would the yellow one deal with superposition? And um, it doesn't actually need to. That's because all the statements that are necessary, except for the very last one where we say that something happens with probability one twelfth, but all the statements that are used by these machines are deterministic statements. So they happen to be cases where the Born rule gives probability one which simplifies the whole thing a lot because otherwise I would need to think about how do you talk about someone who is in a superposition, which would make things more ambiguous, I think. Anyway, thanks for the many questions. Of course, I'm yeah. happy to answer more, but I guess I'm also happy to answer emails. Yeah. Um, See, it's like frequency getting... of emails that I get now about this has dropped. So I am again, I think now in the position that I can actually answer emails because I used to say, please don't send emails. I already get dozens of them per day about this thought experiment. This has now stopped, luckily. So feel free to email me if questions come up. Okay. Uh, maybe let's stop the recording. I'll stop the recording now and let's thank uh, Renato again. <laughs>